Hello and welcome to a special bonus edition of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. In this episode, we're of course talking about the important case of the Crown on the application of Miller and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, 2017 UKSC 5. Well, at long last, we have a decision and it isn't good news for Theresa May's government. It was a questionable choice at best to appeal the judgment on Article 50 handed down by the Divisional Court, and now this has been confirmed by a majority of 8-3 to three in the highest court of the land. As a quick reminder of the issue at stake in this case, it is important to start off by saying that neither side was questioning the result of the referendum held in June 2016, where the British public voted to leave the European Union. Instead, the question was how the UK should go about triggering Article 50, whereupon notice of the intention to leave is served upon the EU. The government argued that ministers could do this by prerogative powers and therefore not require formal parliamentary approval. The reason for this position is that using prerogative powers would be quicker and essentially depoliticise the issue. Miller and the other respondents, on the other hand, argued that not only should Parliament be consulted, but an Act of Parliament should be passed. The basis for this is that leaving the EU would have an effect on UK law, and where this is the case, prerogative powers cannot be used. The appeal also considered important issues of devolution that we will come on to later, but now we will jump straight into the judgement itself, and in particular an examination of the key statute in question the European Communities Act, 1972. The Supreme Court acknowledged the intertwined relationship that exists between UK and EU law by virtue of the Act. In particular, Section 2 allows EU law to not only exist as a source of UK law, but also to take precedence over UK law, as seen in famous cases such as Factor Tame No. 2. They then pointed out that serving notice to leave the EU would inevitably have a huge effect on this relationship by severing ties to the EU law-making institutions completely. Constitutionally, such a fundamental change can only be affected by a new piece of primary legislation. Aside from the constitutional questions, the Supreme Court also noted that withdrawal from the EU would have a significant impact on the rights of individual citizens. To remove those rights requires parliamentary authority for doing so. Now, in theory, the European Communities Act, or any other EU-related act, could have been drafted in such a way so as to allow for ministers to withdraw from the EU, but this cannot be implied into the legislation. It would need to be an explicit provision, and in the absence of this, there is no such authority. Furthermore, while the 2016 referendum was of great political significance, its legal import was almost non-existent because of the lack of relevant provision made in the European Union Referendum Act 2015. Moving on, and in relation to the devolution issue, the Supreme Court did acknowledge that the various devolution acts were indeed passed on the basis of the UK's membership of the EU, But this is not the same thing as continued membership forevermore. Questions relating to foreign affairs are reserved to the central government in Westminster, and this includes our relationship with the European Union. During the case, a fair amount was also made of something called the Sewell Convention, whereby Parliament will generally only legislate on issues that affect Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, with the consent of those devolved legislatures. If this convention had legal standing, it would be hugely significant in allowing those devolved legislatures to throw a spanner in the works of Brexit. However, the court rightly decided that this was a political rather than a legal restraint. So, thinking about the decision as a whole, it is very tempting to throw out an I told you so to the high-profile constitutional lawyers and professors who felt assured that the government was going to win and had the better argument. However, I am bigger than that, and it is interesting to consider the arguments of the other side, so that we get a better idea of the decision as a whole. The best place to start with this is the three dissenting judgments. Their main point was to basically invert the majority decision, 
and say that the European Communities Act does not do anything to prevent the use of prerogative powers. At first this does sound a little trite, but it is true that the UK's relationship with the EU is based in international law, and in this realm the prerogative power does prevail. To add to this, Lord Carnworth stated that Article 50 is only the starting gun for Brexit, and that the process itself will be subject to full parliamentary scrutiny. This is similar to the arguments put forward by a number of so-called constitutional experts, and if you squint and apply a very technical analysis to the case, it is possible to get to the same conclusion. But this ignores the much broader aspects of the case, and means they can't really see the woods for the trees. For a start, Article 50 makes it very clear that the serving of notice starts a two-year timeline at the end of which the member state is no longer part of the EU. Of course, the negotiations mean that it will not be as simple as that, but this is what it states, and so it's not possible to say that this is a purely political thing with no legal impact whatsoever. To add to this, we began the examination of the case by pointing out how intertwined UK and EU law are after nearly 40 years. The rights that have been granted to citizens during that time are massive and wide-ranging. Commencing the process of untangling all of this is not something to be taken lightly. So what now for Theresa May? Well, it looks like we will get a very short act of Parliament that will trigger Article 50, and this will most likely come before Parliament in a few days' time. It's very likely that this will be purely a formality and pass very easily, but at least MPs do get a vote. A process that started by being about taking back control from Brussels and bringing it back to Westminster will, rather fittingly, conclude with a vote in Parliament. Well, thank you very much for listening to this special bonus episode on the Article 50 case. I did want to make sure that I got it to you as soon as I possibly could. I'll be back on next Monday with a regular episode from the Supreme Court. So until then, goodbye for now.